It sure is a nice snowmobile, isn't it? To get a sled as nice as this, the snowmobile has gone through a 40-year evolution. I mean, this modern sled has independent front suspension, soft air travel rear suspension. You can get options like heated handlebars, full gauges, reverse, and other options which make a 300-mile day trip an easy and enjoyable reality. It didn't start off looking like this, of course. Let's take a trip back in time to the early years of the sport. Snowmobiling basically got started in the early 60s, but if you follow the history of it, it even went back as far as 1905, 1908. But this Autobogget is a 1959. It was called a Snow Traveler, very unique machine. They were usually used for business. They were not used for pleasure. They were kind of handmade, ham-formed. The first skidoo that was made was in 59. There was 25 of them made. In 1960, there was 225 made. Then as we went on, they were up into the 15, 2000, and then they even hit the million mark uh, in the early 70s. But as it got into the 60s, and there, were more, there was more of a demand for a snowmobile, they had to mass produce this, this uh, machine. Racing actually was instrumental in getting the machines to where they are now. You'll find that a racing sled like this one that we've got in front of us, it's the early 70s. A lot of the stuff that's on this machine is on machines today. And around the mid-60s, 65, 67, 68, uh, you found a lot of families that, uh, that purchased a snowmobile. And we had uh, manufacturers making cabooses, uh, a lot of Sunday snowmobiling. The trail systems got better. Uh, we brought out grooming. We brought out signs. Clubs started to pop up here and there. And eventually, everything was tied together. And uh, you know, we can go from coast to coast on a snowmobile now. Ever since I was a kid, I've always enjoyed playing in the snow. I was about 10 years old when I had my first ride on an old Skidoo. That'd be a 399 Olympic, and uh, I was hooked right away. The snowbill I'm sitting on is special to me. It's a 72 TNT 440. It's the first snowbill I ever drove all by myself. I think that one of the really great things about being a member of the Antique and Classic Snowbill Club is you get a chance to meet people like yourself who have a similar interest and. It's kind of a camaraderie thing. Everybody's there to help you do what they want to do. That is find a sled that's special to them and restore it to the way they remember it being on the snow years ago. The classic is something that was only a, a rare machine made. And the vintage is a, a machine that's not real old, but it's, it's one that's not in business. And then the antique is the old stuff. The biggest idea of, of the club is so you can help the other guy get old parts and, and fix his machine up. You find out all the other members what they have, you get a machine list of all the different machines, plus you get the, your newsletter that comes out four times a year. A lot of the club members are, are very enthusiastic. If you see one in there, a guy's got a 63 and you've got a question, you can usually phone them and they'll talk to you for two hours about it. It's just like anything else. The more effort you put behind it, the more you get out of the club. Well, I got Skidoo, Bolins, Husky, uh, Eskimoter, Polaris Star, and I got a uh, Autobogan. I got a Mercury, a Suzuki. They're not all, all restored, but they all run, and it's just a matter of getting them finished restoring. But the motor's all running, and we get them out periodic and go to the neighbors. Whenever you meet one of the members of the club, it's, it's really special to watch them describe their sled, because look at their eyes and look at the little bit of sparkle, because they're not just telling you about a piece of machinery, they're telling you a bit, a bit about their past and a bit about themselves. The old sleds weren't fast. You had more fun because of the, there wasn't the speed. And when we first started, we rode together. We pulled the cutter for our kids. Saturday night was strictly for couples. 1971, we filled the gas barrel, 240 gallons of gas when the kids come home at Christmas time. And when they went back at New Year's, the 240 gallons of gas was burnt and we only had two snowmobiles. That was a good snow year. Many snowmobiles were built by companies who also assembled farm machinery, boat motors, cars, like this one from Chrysler, and motorcycles. Even Harley Davidson got into the act. We 
had heard rumors that this Harley Davidson was laying around. And finally what happened was the local Ford dealership, we were in talking to them, and they had the sled. And I went up and looked at it, and they had it and a brand new Mercury 440 SR together. And uh, he was quite taken aback that I wasn't interested in the Mercury and I wanted the Harley Davidson. And except for some cosmetic work, it was basically in the shape you see it now. It had 600, 604, 605 miles when we originally bought it. And that was about 11 years ago and since then we've driven it about 60 miles. We take it out once or twice a year. Harley Davidson made them in the Milwaukee plant from 72 to 75. Uh, the original machines were a steel chassis that was basically derived from the AMF Skidadler. They went to this aluminum modern chassis in 1974. The 1975 machines were basically holdovers from that, and uh, they, uh, that was the only difference. They added the 440 or the 400 cc, depending on the machine. Used a double V suspension, very, very similar to the TNTs at the time, which was made by an outside source, and they called it the Mogul Tamer. The machine has a, an adjustable steering damper on it to control the vibration coming through it. Uh, chrome skis, which Know, whether or not it was a good idea or not. It's tippy, it, uh, it's loud, it has a, I think the muffler was actually, Harley Davidson obviously wanted that, that particular sound. It has a Donaldson tuned pipe on it, and I guess they had Donaldson tune the pipe for that rumbling type Harley Davidson sound. Harley built a unique clutch that was filled with oil, and uh, as typical Harley Davidson, you can never get it to seal properly. This one here leaks, and I, every one I've ever seen actually leaks. I have seen Two or three other ones since I bought this one, and I've never seen another one with an original motor in it. I guess the only reason this one here is still intact is because it never had enough miles on it to really rattle itself to pieces. We found at shows that it's always been a very popular sled because non-snowmobilers can relate to it as well as snowmobilers. You don't have to be a snowmobiler. But the Harley Davidson, just because it's a Harley Davidson, attracts a lot of attention. Motoski was a very old brand. They started in the early 60s. When snowmobiling uh, was in its boom years in the late 60s, early 70s, Motoski became the second, uh, second biggest brand in Canada, second only to Bombardier Skidoo. They used Hearth motors almost exclusively up until 1969. Hearth was one of the most commonly used uh, motors at that time. They probably found their way in at least half the snowmobile brands. The design was fairly typical of most other snowmobiles of that era. They had the uh, the tunnel mounted motor, um, you know, the leaf spring front suspension, the bogey wheel uh, suspension. Uh, the distinction Motoski had was uh, they were famous for making a long track uh, snowmobile. They were about the only manufacturer at that time that was making a long track. And these machines, uh, they're not, uh, you know, obviously they don't go nearly as fast as the modern machines, but even to t try to ride these things at 30 or 40 miles an hour on a, on a rough trail, uh, the sensation of speed is like twice that. Um, you can be going twice, three times as fast on a modern machine and still not get the same kind of thrill as you would at one third the speed in this machine just because you have to stay on top of it. It just takes so much concentration and effort. These machines had to be ridden. You didn't, you didn't just drive them. They literally had to be ridden. And the sensation of speed and the thrill you get from it, um, you know, you don't need to be going 80 or 90 or 100 miles an hour to get that kind of a thrill. In those years, uh, there was no groomed trails. Uh, the snow conditions were deep. Uh, the trails were yet to be made and to be groomed. This was the ideal design actually for the conditions that existed at that time. Uh, you would have a lot of deep snow conditions, you'd have to break trails through uh, tight bush between trees. The machines were narrow, um, uh, they were relatively light compared to today's snowmobiles. Uh, you know, their capabilities in those conditions were probably superior than the, the snowmobiles you have today. It was, uh, it was very funny, I was actually um, we were out driving this Motoski Zephyr, it's a 1971 Motoski Zephyr with a 340 hertz single cylinder engine. One of my friends was over with a 1990 Polaris Indy 500 and uh, I was uh, bragging about the deep snow capabilities of this machine and uh, my friend basically laughed at me. Um, he just couldn't believe that anything that looked like this from 1971 would be a match for his Polaris in any kind of snow condition. So I challenged him to a race but since my machine was 25 years older and uh, 150 cc smaller I get to pick the snow conditions and he, he agreed to that. So that year we had a fair amount of snow at this time. Uh, the snow was drifted up in the edge of the field and I said okay we'll just have a drag race along the edge of the field here where the snow is soft and deep and some ripples, some snow drifts. So anyways uh, at the signal we, we took off and uh, or I took off, he stayed at the spot, basically buried himself right where he sat. By the time he even started moving I was already to the other side of the field so he had an eye-opening experience that day.
Mick Rupp was uh, out of uh, Ohio, uh, Mansfield, Ohio. Um, he started in about 58. Uh, he bought a go-kart and went racing and didn't like the performance and made his own go-kart. And the next thing you know, he had 28 orders for go-karts. Uh, then he moved on to the snowmobiles about 64, and 65 was the first year of full production. And uh, Mick stayed with the company till uh, about 73, I think. And then he left the company, sold it uh, to a consortium, I believe it was. And then they stayed in production till 1978. It's kind of like a nostalgia kick for me. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, everybody out here pretty much had Skidoo, John Deere, uh, the odd Polaris, but uh, some friends of mine down the road, they had rups, they had three of them, and they went like stink. And uh, that's pretty much what I was on most of the time, uh, and I just got hooked on rups. He was one of the first, if not the first, uh, to pioneer the aluminum tunnels uh, back in the 60s, uh, when everyone else was still building those heavier than all get out steel framed snowmobiles, uh, Mick came along with that. And he also uh, was uh, one of the first to jump on the noise reduction bandwagon. And in 1971, he hired a, a noise engineering expert uh, to design new exhaust for his sleds. And in 73, uh, they came out with a, with a new exhaust on the nitros. And it does have an entirely different sound and yet still carries a performance. Uh, in the 72 Nitro, the sides actually folded down like this, and they were originally, on the 72s, bolted on the center section, but they came out with an update kit, which gave you hinges and some uh, quarter-turn fasteners, and once you installed that, then you had uh, complete access without having to do any of the bolts. This one here is actually uh, a Magnum, uh, 76 Magnum liquid. Uh, it's got a few things wrong with it simply because long before I ever got it, somebody whacked a tree with it. And consequently, it's got the narrow nitro front end on it with the nitro extra heat exchanger that was built right into the bumper. Um, the Magnum itself had a wider stance and did not have the heat exchanger there. Um, and the nitro over here to the left, the 72, I would have to say that would be probably my favorite sled. Um, that is what uh, one of the sleds that uh, I was driving when I was a kid and I searched for a while till I finally found that one and uh, it was actually in very good shape when I got it. Uh, I had to do a few odd things, uh, some re-chroming and some panel repair and uh, did a little bit of engine work but it, uh, it would have to be my favorite. Uh, I've been riding Polaris snowmobiles since uh, 1970. Uh, I was introduced uh, to them through uh, my father who worked for Polaris Industries in a town called Bozager, Manitoba, uh, where they used to uh, build them. Since that time I've raced Polaris snowmobiles uh, for a number of years and uh, continue to trail ride uh, today. Uh, I've kept the one machine that's the most significant uh, to me, which is a 1972 Polaris ATX. Um, I seen that particular machine actually built in Rosa when we picked it up and raced that sled for uh, about two years in uh, Manitoba, northwestern Ontario and Minnesota. The particular machine, uh, why I've kept it is it was significant to Polaris in that it was their first aluminum chassis sled. It was the first year that hydraulic disc brakes were standard on them and had the power slide uh, suspension, cleated track, uh, the free air engine and uh, Makuni carburetors. All of these things are still present on uh, Polaris snowmobiles that you buy today. The sled that you're uh, focusing on right now is a 1972 Polaris TX Starfire with a 73 TX hood on it. Polaris, uh, that was how Polaris developed sleds back in the 70s and that the race sled would always be the prototype for the following year's production. So this standard uh, trail hood fits right on the chassis of the 72 race sled where if you look at the 72 TX, it's a completely different animal, so to speak. 
The ATX series was uh, a step down, and it was uh, your your ultimate, I guess, trail machine at, at that time. It was a stock race sled. It would have competed against uh, the Arctic Cat uh, 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 EXT and the Skidoo TNT Free Air at that time, where it's uh, the major sleds that it would have raced against. The uh, TX series was synonymous back in the early 70s for racing. It pretty well dominated. Uh, cross country and oval racing back in the early 70s. In fact, the TX series, the name comes from the parent company that used to own Polaris, which was Textron Industries. TX for Textron. Polaris snowmobiles were uh, founded by the Hattin brothers and uh, in Roseau, Minnesota back in 1954. It was Hattin, uh, uh, Hoist and Derrick which made farm implement equipment. They came up with the Polaris Snow Traveler in the early 50s and then they came out in the 60s with the Colt, the Mustang, the Little Andy. In the early 70s was the Playmate, the Charger, uh, the Mustang again was, st was still there. And then the TX series. The TX was introduced in 1967. The TX 500 was the original TX race sled. In the 70s, the fuel crisis came. At least 100 dropped out. And today you're left with the, the four Arctic Polaris, Yamaha, and Skidoo. I think one of the reasons why Polaris has survived is that and all the other three manufacturers have survived as there's fierce brand loyalty in this uh, sport and industry and uh, it continues today. It's one of the first ones that uh, the Hep brothers when they split up they, uh, they started out with uh, separate businesses, one being Polaris, one being Articat. Um, it was very unique in its time. It had a fiberglass hood, uh, which could be removed. It had uh, a fuel tank, which could be taken out and cleaned. It had uh, your driven pulley. It had a, a brake uh, pedal on another brake drum assembly, which was on the drive shaft. Um, the steering linkages were all ball type. Um, they could be replaced, as you can see here. We took one off. They, they had uh, like a, a removable end, uh, unlike some of the other manufacturers that just bent uh, a round rod with a cotter pin. The exhaust system ran underneath the seat to give you a little heat on the bottom side. Uh, recoil, four stroke motor. Um, tail light had two headlights that are out of this because uh, this is a restoration product and uh, they even had a slider rail suspension back then. Uh, the sliders were uh, made of hardwood. Um, there were two of them, this is just one of them and uh, that was their, their slider as, as most machines are today. Now a lot of people they ask questions, well who was the first to do this and who was the first to do that? One thing I can tell you, the first sled made with a jack shaft was hands down Articat. Here's living proof of it right here. They got laughed at when they actually brought out the fiberglass hood. The aluminum chassis that were all held together with pop rivets, but all the manufacturers today now are using aluminum chassis. They're all pop riveted together. Cat wasn't always recognized as a cat. Um, they actually had a polar bear that was in the early 70s and is still recognized today uh, and the leopard skin or the cheetah skin um, all of the names like the king cat, the kitty cat, uh, cheetah, the jaguar, the, the panther they were all in the cat family and that has something to do with the name Arty Cat. They shut down for a period of two years or actually two and a half years the um, manufacturer sold their rights to the employees and the employees started it up. And if you think about the auto industry, if that would have happened to, let's say Ford, Chrysler, uh, or GM, I doubt very much if anyone would rush back to buy one. And with Articat, the people that, that uh, were Articat lovers or Articat fans, they were so loyal, they went right back, no questions asked, they, they just bought another Articat. And, um, it, it's, it's a real statement. Uh, they were very, very loyal. Articat was right into Articat wear. I'm just putting on a jacket that, uh, that I wore as a young lad. And uh, I don't have to tell you how much razzing I had uh, 
I don't know if that picks up the color, but that's pretty bright purple. And anybody that would wear something like this uh, snowmobiling, well, you really had to like your Articat, or better yet, you had to love your Articat. And, uh, you know, it speaks for itself, like how many people would wear something like this. Racing was always a big part of snowmobiling. There was a lot of pride out on the track, and the technology kept improving with every race. Many of the improvements seen on the track would appear in consumer sleds the following winter. The love of lizards is uh, established way back in uh, 72 by going to the Peterborough races. I always thought I was gonna own one, Wanted on one. One day I finally owned one. And it's it's a disease. You gotta be careful. It really hangs on to you and you can't get enough of it. This 1973 uh, GR340 is one of five that were originally, uh, not one of five, but one of 50 that was built. There was 10 lots of five made, three, 292, 340, 440, 650, and 800. Um, they built them in 1972 on the spring uh, for grass racing in the 72 season. This combination of color scheme and wedged front look was put in place to show the public this type of sled will be the production sled for the public in 1973. The uh, company is very uh, heavy into R&D and really, um, there was a lot of the new development did show up in the Blizzard line way before it ever became part of the production sleds for the companies. Uh, one of the main changes was the relocation of the motor towards the front. This uh, also introduced a lot of aluminum content in the body, plus a lot of fiberglass. These uh, products and materials were not used in the prior 1972 and older public machines. In this particular sled, I'd say there's about 120 hours of work in it. The first prototypes were made by uh, you know, Rajan Houle, whose father had a farm equipment business, and the prototypes were built in about 62, 63. They had a rear engine. Uh, but the actual first production year was 66, which is the machine at the far end of this row. They were very similar to, say, the early Ski-Doo. Uh, they had unique uh, attachment for the leaf spring onto the front skis. Uh, other than that, they were basically a, a small two-stroke hearth engine, 12 horsepower, and fairly standard for the day. This is a 1971. Uh, this was the sport version of, uh, of a, just a trail sled uh, of the smallest engine size. It was 300 cc. It's a Saks 290 SS engine. Uh, there are approximately 25 horsepower. And uh, there was also a model of the same body. It was called an SX 440. It had a 440 twin Saks engine. Uh, these came with uh, sliders. And they're a two-piece slider uh, rather than the one long slide bar. And that was dispensed with the uh, next year. Uh, it was found the single, the uh, one-piece slide bar made more sense. And uh, they were trying not to copy Arctic Cat at first, I believe. But uh, I think that's why the two-piece came about. <laughs> In the early years, the factories put a lot of money into racing uh, uh, because it, the idea was to race and win on Sunday and sell sleds on Monday. Um, Ski roll was like the rest of them. They'd put a lot of money into the factory racing team. In 1976, the IFS racers, uh, that was their official snow pro team then. Uh, there were six of those sleds made, and they're all liquid-cooled 440, 340, and 250 Kohler engines. They were sponsored by partly by Kohler of Canada and Ski Rule, and Gilles Villeneuve was basically the engineer. They uh, handmade all of the six sleds. There may have been one or two extras, but we only know of six for sure. Um, the, 
they pioneered the independent front suspension uh, in that, that would really win races. There was a few machines had them before, Chaparral, for example, in about 73, but uh, the ski rule with Gilles Villeneuve uh, made the independent front suspension work on a race sled, and they actually did win some races with them. This particular one is the 440, and it was raced by Jacques Villeneuve and uh, several of them ended up being raced the next year and painted different colors. I've seen them blue, red and black and with scorpion printed on them. So this one has still to be restored. <laughs> I think the ski roll line was probably known for its style, uh, probably number one. Uh, the style was considered to be ahead of its time. For myself, uh, an earlier ski roll like these uh, still looks good even with the uh, brand new snowmobiles, you know, the styling is quite up to date even now, today. I do like the 71 Racers, uh, I like the 74 Laser, um, the 76 IFS Racers, I, 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 it's hard to pick a favorite. The only thing I would say is I wish they still made them. <laughs> but if they did make them I probably wouldn't have all these and we wouldn't be getting as much attention. Seventy-two Villain, seventy-three and seventy-four Alouette Super. In seventy-four, the Villeneuve's had the twin track as well. This is a six-fifty triple, a Kohler engine. Um, there's a couple of differences. They made a Villain four-forty and a Villain six-fifty. Um, they had to make some provisions in the uh, in the cowling and steering system on the six-fifty to make room for. They added a jack shaft drive system and the extra exhaust pipe. Some of the liquid cooled race sleds with open expansion chambers are quite a bit louder than this one. The uh, villains uh, did more in a straight line than they did go around corners. They wouldn't run for very long on a warm day. They would start bogging down and uh, if you tried too long you'd just burn a piston. It's uh, like driving a boat anchor. <laughs> it's a heavy old machine. Um, it's pretty temperamental to get the three cylinders all running just right. Many of these early snowmobiles were built purely for slow family fun, but in the early 70s engine power began to increase rapidly. The power being displayed on racetracks was finding its way into consumer models, and if there was one sled that epitomized power, it was the Kohler-powered Mercury Snow Twister. Uh, it's a 76 uh, 340 Snow Twister, liquid cooled, and I came by that sled back in uh, 1981. And I happened to uh, come across a fellow in North Bay. Uh, he was a dealer at one time, and I uh, was talking to him about uh, Mercury's and uh, whether he had any parts and that, and he uh, said that he had a lot of parts left over and uh, wondered if he could uh, find me a sled. Phoned me a couple of weeks later, and he had one. I drove up and backed it up to his place and loaded her in, brought her home, had her ever since. <laughs> I took it right down to the ground, a uh, bare tunnel. Took every nut and bolt out of it, and uh, a lot of the parts I had were, uh, when I restored it, they were brand new that I accumulated over the years, bought them here and there, and it gives you quite a thrill. It's, uh, it's got torque steer. When you hammer the throttle, it actually wants to twist. Maybe that's how it got part of its name, I don't know. But uh, it actually does try to twist on you and uh, steer. Uh, the, of course, the skis are in the air when you, when you got your uh, throttle to the bar anyway. Back in the old days, uh, uh, Mercs were, uh, were something to be reckoned with. Uh, when they first come out, uh, well, of course they've been out since the mid-60s, but in uh, 1974, Mercury committed themselves to go racing. And uh, when they put the 74 uh, free air out there, and basically it was a trail sled that uh, they put on the racetrack and they raced at uh, stock, and it wa there wasn't many sleds that uh, 
would beat it. And they come in there at the end of the race, Merck was first, second, and third. Uh, that was a real uh, bulletproof engine uh, that did really well in racing. And from there in 75, the Snow Twister became a 340 and a 440 for air. And in 76, they had a 250 liquid cooled, a 340 liquid cooled, and a 440 liquid. And uh, you can, I had my 250 at a, at a show, and people come by and they all remember the Snow Twister. Um, it really made a mark. Even today in the drag races, it'll still hold its own. Uh, the Mercury sled is an awesome sled to race. It's uh, something if they were still allowed to race today, they, they'd still be winning. And that's uh, even against some of the newer ones the, with the uh, big CCs. Restoring an old sled is like restoring an old car. You'll need a complete chassis and you'll need parts. Some members of the Antique Snowmobile Club have their private collections of restorable sleds and parts. Others will check the classified ads or even head off to the snowmobile auction. It's a nice machine, it's the right kind. If you're looking for old antique sleds, hard to find sometimes. Uh, at an auction you can find a lot of them all in one place at one time. You look around, see if you're interested in anything and uh, wait around, see what it goes for, see what it's worth for you. And uh, a lot of times you pick up a lot of, uh, a lot of old sleds here that uh, would be otherwise hard to find. We have them here right from 1969 right up to 1996. A lot of familiar faces. I see, uh, I see buyers and, and bidders here that were here at our very first sale in 1980. We've, we've uh, had phone calls uh, from as far away as Ottawa in the east and Windsor in, in the west and looking for a specific sled. And uh, it looks like we're able to accommodate them because we have, the, we have them here today. 775, anyone else? 775. We hunt high and low for them. Um, I know I'm a collector of, of sleds. I've got a, a fair number of them. I look for something that's complete. I look for something that's unique and something that's different. Not only do I like blizzards, I like uh, sleds that have a lot of uh, nostalgia behind them, rarity. I enjoy a rarity. I like, I like to have something of one or two or even one, which is hard to do, but uh, I've been able to do a good collection uh, over the years and I've got some sleds here that people have really heard about but never seen. People have asked questions in, in why uh, one machine is more desirable to restore than the next. Um, everyone would love to have a tin hood skidoo and uh, arty cat or something really different like a snow bug, a raider or any rear engine uh, machine and that would be early 60s, uh, 59 through to I bet you 64. Before you start doing a, a major uh, restoration project, uh, you have to do a lot of research in books. Uh, you have to learn a lot of the how the proper color, the schemes were, the decals were, how the seats were arranged because um, people do change things over the course of, of the years of ownership. You have to do a complete strip down and you have to start all over from scratch. Every nut and bolt has to be categorized and you have to make sure that it's the proper bolt going in the proper place, the proper rubber products that go in around the, all the soft spots in the, in the machine. Uh, you do have to do a complete motor rebuild and chassis, do, chassis work and you have to also do all your hydraulic brakes, since this has a hydraulic brake system, it has to be all gone over. It's a total rebuild, it's right from day one. The biggest problem is if you're starting with a sled that isn't complete, if you don't have all the components for the restoration, is actually finding the, the pieces. We have a really good source, um, Bill Fullerton at Northland Creation is actually one of the founding members of the Antique and Classic Snowball Club. We use him as a, as a really good source of information. Um, I do belong to the American Vintage Snowmobile Club and I also belong, of course, belong to the Canadian Club. And you do meet a lot of people who have the same interests or, or they're not interested in my particular model that I like but they know where there was, let's say, an old blizzard but they're, uh, they're um, like for Doug, for instance, Doug McElwain, he's ski rule. Uh, he does not worry about a blizzard so he'd give me the information and I'd follow it up. Cat really didn't get onto the market until 62 to 63. So this is a 63 and to my knowledge there's not too many of them in Canada. 
Um, I would say there's a handful and you can more than likely count them on four fingers. This being one of them, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to getting into this one as a restoration job. There's two pieces that I need. Um, I'm looking for a fuel cap and I'm looking for a sediment bowl uh, off of the carb. Minor. I've got everything else. I've got brand new decals. Um, the windshield, I've got new. Uh, it's just a matter of taking it, disassembling it, sandblasting it and putting it together. For snowmobiles, they, they are 30 and 40 years old and they've just reached their time. In 1963, nobody restored a 1957 Bel Air, but they do in the 80s and the 90s. And that's the same way with snowmobiles. Now that we're in the late 90s, people will restore 1964 or 73 Skidoo because it's, it's time. They, they, they've, they've reached the maturity and it's time to take care of them now. If I was looking for the ultimate snowmobile to restore, it'd probably one that's already restored so I wouldn't have to spend all the time and money on it. This is a, a Chaparral SSX. I guess they were the first to, to bring out uh, the new suspensions that uh, we see today, the IFS suspension. This is a sled that most people crave to have to do a restoration on. Um, there's not many of them around. Most of the racers were either t-boned in the side, plowed in the back, or plowed in the front. And uh, this one here, it, it, it's basically all here. It's got to be disassembled, cleaned up, painted, and uh, you know, little odds and sods, trinkets replaced and, uh, and put on, and it would be ready for a show. People not involved in snowmobiling often refer to it as skidooing. This came about as a result of the vast popularity of the Bombardier Skidoo. Their designs in the early 60s set the basic layout that many other manufacturers would use. The 1960 Skidoo, um, one of the, the first year of production. Um, serial number 6099, so it's the 99th sled in production. It was about two years um, from the time that I purchased it till the time that it, the restoration was finished. Uh, I had to replace uh, a lot of metal in the chassis because there was quite a bit of rot. Um, both sides on the cab have been replaced and the, the footrests have been replaced. Most of the parts were there. It was pretty much complete. Um, I spent most of the time during the restoration trying to search down the the rubber chain case cover um, because they're an oddball size they were only used in 60 and 61 um, so I spent quite a bit of time trying to find one of those um, ended up paying $50 for it it's just a simple little piece of rubber but somebody had it and I paid his price all of the 1960 uh, model skidoos had wooden skis and coil spring front suspension um, and they carried it on to 1961 and then at um, serial number 61299, they went, to, they went away from the wooden skis and coil springs and they went to wooden skis with leaf springs, which um, really didn't turn out to be a very good idea. Um, so shortly thereafter, they went to steel skis with leaf springs. It was the, the first year of production for Skidoo. They did build sleds in 59, which were hand-built. It wasn't really a production year. This is really the first year of production for Skidoo, and they... Um, Essentially, I guess we can say that they invented what we know as the modern snowmobile because basically the design hasn't changed with two skis up front, the motor in front of you, a uh, passenger sits over the track, and uh, pretty much that's what we're riding today. There were plenty of other snowmobiles before the Skidoo, but um, they didn't really have the same design. If you're uh, a Ford lover, if you could have the first car they built, that would be uh, a big prize, I imagine. So in my eyes, this is my pride and joy. My 63, uh, the reason why I did it was it was my first old snowmobile purchase, but um, it is, in 1963, it was the first year that uh, Bombardier went to a Rotax engine, and it was also the first year that they went to a fiberglass hood. So it makes it a, a milestone in, in Skidoo history. But the importance to me is that 
I really enjoy snowmobiling and snowmobiling is is a pretty major part of Canadian history in my opinion. We like to start with the chassis and then then you move on to smaller components like the, you just do one piece at a time. Um, the motors, actually we've got the original paint code for the Kohler 7 horse which is nice and we also have the original paint code the yellow, the Bombardier yellow. It's actually called Old Yeller is the name of the paint. It hasn't been driven yet but um, this winter on a nice day I'd like to take it out in the lake just for a quick little buzz. It's a 1965 Skidoo. I've had the sled for four years and it's taken me four years. It's an ongoing project to restore it. Uh, it was pretty rough. I picked it up out of a farmer's field and it was sitting in mud. So uh, a lot of grinding, a lot of painting, but uh, it's worked out. <laughs> Rides like a buckboard, <laughs> but they all did back then. Oh, it's fun though. You get a lot of looks. Uh, a lot of people turning their heads. I had a 63 when, we, when I was a kid, and that was the closest one I could get at the time to restore. I've always wanted to restore one, and uh, that's the one I come across. But since then, I've found a 63, and I've just restored it. Well, I first started my skidoo in 67, which I bought it. The wife said I was crazy, but she rides more than I do. And from then on, we've bought one and two machines a year. And when we first started, the old machines were passed down to our kids, and they rode the old machines. Uh, we always had six machines licensed and permanent when our kids were all at home. Skidoo was a dealer in our area and we got started with them and you just can't beat that yellow. That's all it's doing. We have seen old sleds and met their proud owners. Like other collectors, these people restore them for much more than a material value. They preserve the moments and memories of a specific time in our culture. The winters that controlled our forefathers' lives were tamed with the snowmobile. Instead of dreading the approaching winter, Canadians would look forward to the cold winter months when they could get out on their sleds. Instead of winter survival, we had winter recreation. When I go to a, a snowball show, I love to have them on display where you have a father and son come by and the father says, Jeepers, I used to race one of them and, and there's the machine, he can show his son you know, because these machines are now 20, 25 years old. It just, it's, it's a thrill, like you're going along, you're barely moving, but we, you get neck and neck, and, and it's, it's a crowd pleaser. You show up anywhere on an old sled and people always, you know, actually in the wintertime especially, because the uh, popularity of snowmobiling is, is growing and people like to see these old sleds, especially in original condition. People look at them and uh, they remember back when they were kids, you know having the same machine. I grew up when the 60s muscle cars were around and I like them and when I first got into snowmobiling the first few years were a lot of this type of snowmobile so that that's the main thing you're looking back. Part of the reason I guess uh, why I, I like the older stuff is uh, you can have more machines for less money. <laughs> I guess for me it's going to is a chance for me to go back in time. Also, it's a time. It's a way that I can introduce my young children to the sport of snowmobiling as I remember it. It's a simpler sled. It's a simpler time and more fun. I, I carry a pair of binoculars in the vehicle, and I'm so bad that uh, we're out for a Sunday drive, and I'm gawking here and gawking there and shoulder to shoulder type of thing. And all of a sudden, you see a flash of blue or a yellow. You slam on the brake, and you back up, and you pull out your binoculars to have a better look. And and sure enough, it's an old sled, but. Uh, and the unfortunate thing is, is you go over to it and while well, it's been sitting outside for a number of years, maybe eight to ten years, and everything is either rotted off of it or falling apart, the motors are seized and tracks are embedded into the dirt and the skis are completely rotted off of it. And uh, I, just, I just would want, if anybody has something like this sitting around inside in a barn that's fairly complete, fairly good shape, get it to a member. I think it's just important that we collect some of this stuff, we restore it, and that it should be on display for everyone to enjoy and to look at. And uh, I, the only way I can think of is a museum where it's open to the public. And I just think it would be a real bonus to the industry and uh, to our community. These collectors also preserve an era when, as kids, their first taste of freedom was on an early snowmobile. 
We've met the proud owners and their snowmobiles, and we know their work will be appreciated by future generations. And who knows, maybe this new generation will be restoring this snowmobile in 20 years. I'm Ken Sylvester. Thanks for watching. Is that good? Vroom, vroom.